The location of Switzerland at the heart of Western Europe makes it a vital communications link between its larger neighbors, and its superbly run railway network is a tribute to the legendary Swiss efficiency. While Switzerland has had a federal railway almost from the beginning, this has always coexisted alongside numerous private enterprises. For despite its small area, Switzerland has more individual railway companies within its borders than any other country in the world. One of the biggest of these, the Raetian Railway, is to be found in the southeast of Switzerland, in Canton Graubünden. It was originally founded in 1895 to build the Albula line between Chur and St. Moritz, and almost immediately took over the newly opened Lankart Davos Railway Company nearby. The system was later extended with lines to Decentis and the Lower Engadine, while the Davos and Albula lines were linked via Filiseur. Other private railways had also opened in the Canton, serving the growing tourist industry. The Bernina Line, built in 1910, linked Samoritz to Italy, while in 1914 the Arosa Line between Chur and Arosa was completed. These were absorbed into the Raetian system in the 1940s, leaving one railway company to cover the region. The town of Chur is the administrative center of the Raetian Railway as well as for the Canton. The main station is not only the starting point for many RHB journeys, but is the terminus for the main federal railway. Connections are also made with the many post buses which serve outlying villages in the region, and a new PTT coach station is being built above the main railway station so passengers can stay warm and dry in less clement weather. Plans are also underway for the construction of a new underground building to bring Space Age lines to Hur's other railway station. Starting as it did as a separate company, the Arosa line does not share the grand main station. Instead, its more homely terminus is in the street outside, where its little red locomotives and coaches mingle harmoniously with passing foot and car traffic. Although the Arosa line's wagons are able to run on the main Raetian railway through the mixed gauge sidings so that goods traffic can travel from the region onto the network, the Arosa locomotives must stay outside as the line operates on a different electric current from the rest of the system. While the Raetian railway operated with steam locomotives on the Albula and Davos lines until the 1920s, the Arosa line was designed for electric traction right from the start. Although that didn't prevent the occasional steam locomotive from making a small diversion. None of the original Kerr Arosa railway motor coaches now survive, and the locomotives which operate on the line today date from the 1950s and 1970s, after the amalgamation with the RHB. It is possible to travel to Arosa inside one of the comfortable coaches, but the line passes through some particularly attractive scenery, so a very popular way to ride during the summer months is in one of the special panoramic wagons, which this route shares with the Benina line at the other end of the network. This will allow us the opportunity to enjoy the warm summer sunshine, as well as giving unrestricted views of the attractions en route. The first part of our journey lies along the streets of Chur, where the rails are incorporated into the road surface. The train takes precedence over other forms of traffic, even the normally omnipotent post buses. Traffic lights are set to allow the train a free run through the town. And while motorists can be startled when a locomotive overtakes them along the street, good nature generally prevails, and courteous driving on all sides leads to only short delays.
At the Obertor Junction, our train must slow to allow traffic at this busy corner to move out of the way before it can leave the main road and turn into the narrower Plesser Quay. Our train's first stop is only a short step away from Hur's beautiful old town, and it would be a pity to miss the opportunity to visit the picturesque buildings and quaint streets. There's been a settlement here since prehistoric times, and the town grew to importance during the Roman period, when it was made the capital of the large province of Raetia Prima. Because of its strategic position at a crossroads along the River Rhine, traders and merchants flocked here, bringing an affluence which is reflected in the splendid architecture of the old quarter. The River Plesser marks the ancient city boundary, and the old toll house nearby is a reminder of the commercial traffic which has crossed here throughout the ages. Today, it's a restaurant with a bird's eye view of the railway. Our journey continues, with the track running alongside the main road to Arosa. However, this soon branches off to climb up the valley side, and we will not meet it again until almost the end of our route. The depot at Sand is still the main home for the Arosa locomotives and stock, although nowadays repairs and renovations are carried out at the main Raishan workshops at Lankart. The line now leaves Hur and will follow the Plesso Valley all the way to its destination at Arosa, making a right-angled turn at Langvis. After sand, the railway moves onto its own dedicated track, ready for the steep gradients which lie ahead. At first, there was talk of using rack to assist with the climb on the first section of the line. But this idea was abandoned, and the entire route is worked by addition. We are now approaching the first tunnel on the line. Along this section alone, there are no less than 22 tunnels and galleries, because of the shifting nature of the valley's sides, it's necessary to be vigilant, and new work is always being carried out. 
Two of the galleries along this section were built as recently as 1987. The impressive viaduct, which soars some 53 metres over the Castilla Tobel stream, was originally a three-arched structure built entirely of stone. However, the steeply sloping valley side is continually moving, and gradually the supporting pillars began to shift, distorting the arches. Eventually, the pillar bases had to be strengthened, while the stone superstructure was replaced by a fishbelly girder bridge, giving greater flexibility and strength. The station at Loen Castile is built in the form of a traditional wooden Swiss chalet, not surprisingly in a valley dominated by trees. What's more unusual is the fact that all the station buildings along the line, with the exception of Coeur and Arosa at either end, have been built to exactly the same design, although all balconies face the sun. Each of the buildings has a motto or inscription written on the face. In the case of Loen Station, it's where there's a will, there's a way. While this is undoubtedly a tribute to the perseverance of the original engineers of the line, it could also apply to some of the passengers. For although the village of Lewin is only a brisk walk above the station, passengers travelling to Castile have hundreds of feet to climb before reaching their destination high up on the mountainside. We have also climbed several hundred feet on our journey, though with rather less effort. However, the train still has to gain almost as much height again before reaching the next station. Immediately after leaving Luen, the train plunges into a tunnel at almost 400 metres, the longest on the line. The engineers who constructed this line were faced with a formidable task and the building of this 25-kilometer route, which began in January 1912, took almost three years to complete. A measure of the difficulties faced here can be judged when we remember that the line from Lancard to Davos, which is twice the length, was built in just over half the time.
The valley now begins to open out and the trees press less closely, allowing us good views of this beautiful region known as the Shanfig. The origins of this name have been lost in the mists of time, but it's believed to derive from the Latin and mean Valley of the Forests. St. Peter's Station, the siding is occupied with log wagons, illustrating the importance of timber to this region. Harvesting this abundant natural product is vital for the economy of the Shanfig. Whilst some of the timber is processed in local sawmills, powered by the fast-flowing mountain streams which feed the river Plesseur, a great deal is exported from here to Italy along the Albula and Bernina lines of the ration system. It would be wasteful, however, to export wood and import other building materials. Hence, the villagers of St. Peter's have been using timber for centuries to build both their barns and their houses. Even today, traditional construction methods are used. The careful overlapping of logs helping to make structures secure against the wind while moss caulking keeps out the snow. The surrounding hillsides are dotted with small timber barns, which are used to store hay for the cattle during the cold winter ahead. In summer, the grass is harvested, and no slope is too steep or patch too small to be overlooked. Not only farmers need hay, hunters also save any available mowings in order to feed the deer and keep the herds alive during the harsh months when snow covers the ground. We're now about halfway along our journey and have gained some 572 meters in altitude, about half the height we need to climb before reaching our destination. The warm summer sunshine which is benefiting the farmers is also making our journey a pleasant one. The Arosa line is powered by 2,400 volts DC, which allows the use of lightweight motor baggage cars to haul the trains. When passenger and goods traffic is heavy, the steep gradients make double heading essential.
The station at Peist is a scheduled passing place for trains, a single track operation making it essential for the timetable to run smoothly. At first sight, the sloping valley around Peist Station and the village above presents a placid and permanent appearance, giving the impression of a landscape unchanged for hundreds of years. However, this is an illusion, as a wider view of the Shanfig testifies, revealing deep scars of bare earth between the lush green slopes. The valleys of the region are the product of the Ice Age, when much of Switzerland was buried under a thick blanket of snow and ice, with only the tops of the highest mountains exposed. Over thousands of years, the glaciers have gradually retreated, leaving a soft rock and earth rubble coating the valley sides, making it vulnerable to erosion by wind and more especially by water. The mountain streams which flow swiftly down the steep valley sides into the river Plesseur have greatly contributed towards shaping the surrounding landscape. Where vegetation is lost, whole slopes become endangered and trees and grass find it difficult to regain a hold on the continually shifting screes. Over the centuries, the elements have weathered parts of the landscape into fantastic shapes. Where an obstacle formed a hard cap, erosion did not take place, resulting in the creation of tall rock pillars. These can be formed under trees, or more commonly boulders, and are known locally as earthmen. The soft terrain created difficulties for the builders of the coaching road in the last century, and a service along the valley to Langvis was not established until 1875, with the route to Arosa only being completed ten years later. Over the years, erosion was a constant danger, and in some places the encroaching slopes advanced so greatly that the road was left within a few metres of the valley edge. In the 1980s, the problem became so great that parts of the old road had to be closed and three new tunnels bored through the mountainside to allow motor traffic safe passage. Our railway line, running below the road, continues its way along the left-hand side of the valley towards Langvis. The line now begins to level out, and our ascent is less noticeable as we run swiftly through the lush green fields, past traditional wooden barns.
many side streams which flow down from the surrounding mountain chain into the Plessa Valley presented a variety of challenges to the railway builders. In order to span the Frauentobel Gully, a central girder of 48 metres was erected, the longest single span on the line. The Grungitobel Viaduct is one of the most impressive structures on the Arosa line and a triumph of engineering. An intricate timber framework was built to support this ferro concrete construction with its central span of 86 meters. Its modern appearance is deceptive as it was built in 1913, one of the first reinforced concrete bridges in Europe. The valley beside the viaduct contains one of the most impressive collection of earthmen in the region. At Langvis, the valley divides. The Plesser River continues towards Arosa, while the Sapin and Fondi brooks branch off into the mountains, proving a mecca for walkers of all ages and abilities. The village of Langvis, the name literally means long field, is another charming collection of pretty shuttered chalets in traditional style. The maintenance of these old buildings has to be ongoing, and the Swiss are meticulous in their repairs and renovations. Work is sympathetically carried out to ensure that none of the original characteristics are lost. However charming the villages, the goal of the nature-loving walker is the unspoilt mountain slopes high above the tree line. Lofty stone crags are an irresistible attraction to the climber, while the lush hillsides, on closer inspection, reveal a wealth of wild flora and fauna. Picking a bunch of wild flowers to press can provide a charming souvenir of your walk.
but be careful what you gather, as many of the rarer species are protected by law. While some opt for pedal power, we take the opportunity of a leisurely stroll downhill following the course of the river back along the valley. The ice cold waters of the tumbling stream give hot feet a new lease of life while keen-eyed walkers might be rewarded with the glimpse of a shy red squirrel. Down on the valley floor, the waters from the Fondi and Sapon brooks combine before joining the River Plesseur. While the sparkling waters naturally draw the eye, a dramatic vista towers high above us. The Langvis viaduct, soaring 62 meters above the river, is the most impressive structure on the Arosa line. And like the Grunchitobel viaduct, was an early ferro-concrete masterpiece. Concrete piers were built to support a wooden framework upon which the shuttering was erected. Then no less than 7,000 cubic meters of concrete and 250 tons of iron went into its construction. It was completed in 1914 and with a central span of 100 meters could then proudly claim to be the largest single span concrete viaduct in the world. Today this graceful structure stands free of all supports, although one of the concrete piers still remains if you know where to look. After Langvis, the line makes a right angle across the River Plesseur to continue up the main valley to Arosa. The train now runs along the right-hand side of the valley, climbing steadily all the way. We now have less than seven kilometers of our journey left, but still have to gain some 400 meters in height.
There are numerous photo opportunities along the route as a permanent reminder of our journey, and the panorama wagon gives good all-round visibility. The gradients here are steep, one in 16, so our train can only achieve speeds of around 30 kilometers an hour. Ziruti, we are reunited with the road to Arosa, and the two ways will not be far apart for the remainder of the journey. Our open panorama wagons prove popular with travelers during the summer months. There are five of these specially built carriages which were constructed on the underframes of redundant Bernina line baggage vans. And the cheerful yellow livery make them a colorful sight on the line. The airy framework supports a canopy when the weather is unkind, as well as protecting passengers from the overhead catenary. In order to gain sufficient height, the track now winds in two large loops, one of which contains the perfect house for any train enthusiast. The lucky occupants here have a garden railway second to none.
Nearing Arosa, the train runs above the Stausee, an artificial lake created by damming the Plesso River. While this stretch of water provides a delightful view for our journey, it has the more important task of generating electricity, some of which is being used to power our train. Passing through the Eck Tunnel, we have the first sight of Arosa perched on the slopes above our track. We've now climbed over 1,100 meters and traveled almost 26 kilometers since the start of our journey. While this is the shortest of the lines on the Raishan system, it certainly justifies its claim to be one of the prettiest. The line now enters the last of the 29 tunnels and galleries along the route. This takes our train for almost 300 meters right under the center of Arosa. Journey's end is by the Obersee, or Upper Lake, at the last of the eight stations on the line. The first train arrived here on the 12th of December 1914, and the railway has proved popular ever since for both summer and winter visitors. Arosa today is a thriving holiday resort, although until the end of the last century, the region was inhabited almost exclusively by farming families. There have been small settlements here for many centuries, with immigrants arriving over the mountain passes from nearby Davos. However, thanks to tourism, the population increased fourfold between 1900 and 1930. Today, the upper lake is a popular location for boaters and fishermen a far cry from its original use as a watering hole for cattle. Arosa has two natural lakes within its boundaries, and the smaller Untersee is perfect for bathers. In this landlocked country, it's the Swiss version of a seaside holiday. Ball games are also taken seriously here, and sports lovers have the opportunity to improve their tennis with professional instruction at the summer school. For the less energetic, a leisurely round of golf can be enjoyed on the links above the resort. However, some of the fairways offer a challenge for the less experienced player. There is no shortage of easy walks around the perimeter of the village. Just a little effort can bring some stunning views, and the trek down is invariably easier.
The higher settlement of Inner Arosa, with its picturesque mountain chapel dating back to the 15th century, was one of the original farming settlements, although it's now better known as a winter ski venue. While many of the houses here retain their traditional appearance, with colorful flowers looking their best against the sun-darkened wood, Arosa also bears the influence of modern architecture. Today, Arosa is a prosperous resort, supplying its numerous visitors with all the comforts and needs that a discerning clientele require. The rival Obsi Express offers a means of exploring this hidden gem of the Alps from lakeside to ski lift, as does leisurely perambulation. Or you can rest your weary feet, yet still see the sights by riding in a fer de kutsche. Journeying into the very heart of the Swiss Alps can be a memorable excursion along the Arosa line.